everybody in this room to kind of get engaged here. Uh, so we're going to do the first panel. Uh, I'm going to invite our panelists up here. Uh, I'll introduce them here briefly. Uh, Janice and Simon and Chitra and Brad and Shekhar, if you could come up here and find your way, uh, find yourself a nice seat. You need to grab something? Okay, go grab. Um, and what we'll do is I'm going to ask each of them to talk for about three or four minutes. If they go on for more than that, feel free to throw something at them. Uh, and, and after that, you're, they're yours. Uh, you know, if you guys have no questions for them, I have a few, but I have a feeling you will have some things that you want to ask them that you want to say to them. Uh, and, uh, that's really the goal. Uh, we're going to go, uh, until it's 3.20 now. Boy, we're right on time. Look at that. That's amazing. We're going to go right until 4.10, and then we're all going to take a break. Uh, so you can stretch, you can talk to each other. Uh, but uh, what I'll do now is I'll introduce our panelists. Uh, they'll say a few things each, and then uh, let's open the floor to questions from you. The first panel, the theme for what we're going to talk about here the next hour or so is, how do we get boots on the ground and how do we achieve sustainable development in mental health? So that's easier said than done, as, as those of you who've tried to do that uh, can probably all attest to. But we got some really smart people here who will share with us uh, their views on this. So I'm going to say a few things about the panelists. So Shekhar already introduced uh, Dr. Janice Cooper. Janice is country representative for health with the Carter Center in Liberia. She leads a program for their mental health program. She oversees a national training policy and support program to expand capacity for mental health services delivery in Liberia. Uh, we have Dr. Simon Jaguna. Uh, Dr. Simon is the director of mental health at the Ministry of Health in Kenya. He's trained and has experience as a psychiatrist uh, and in mental health broadly. He has expertise in strategic leadership development, health systems management, mental health policies, and the management of substance use related and addictive disorders. We have Ms. Chitra Hanstad. Chitra is from here in Seattle. Uh, she's the executive director for World Relief Seattle. That's the largest refugee resettlement and services agency in Washington state. She recently returned from India where she spent the last year consulting for Justice Ventures International, working on anti-human trafficking campaigns, strategic planning, and fund development. And we have one of our own, Brad Wagoner. Dr. Brad Wagoner is an assistant professor in the Department of Global Health here at UW. He serves as a technical advisor to Health Alliance International, one of the big centers that we have uh, in the Department of Global Health here. He focuses his work on using innovative implementation science methods to answer important questions around improving public sector health systems and health policies broadly. And finally, you've already met my dear friend, Shekhar. Uh, Shekhar is uh, currently a professor at Harvard in their School of Public Health. Uh, until very recently, he was at the World Health Organization where he was the director of the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse. So welcome and thanks to all of you. Uh, I'm going to start, I think, on the far end here. Uh, actually, no, I'm going to start with Janice. Sorry, we're going to not go in order. Janice, can you say a few things about uh, getting boots on the ground and ach achieving sustainable development in mental health? Thank you. Your attention. Hello. Does this work? Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you've heard a, a little bit already about the fact that the commission really tried to tie uh, mental health to SDGs. I also wanna say that a big focus of uh, the commission was also on the focus on youth and young people as the instruments for change in mental health. So let me talk a little bit about our boots on the ground in Liberia. I come from a small country on the west coast of Africa that has strong ties uh, to the United States. Uh, the 2007 Lancet Commission report was launched uh, and served as a launching pad for us in Liberia uh, in, in terms of our work. And we foresee that in 2018, 
Lancet having the same impact for Liberia and definitely for other uh, Carter Center programs uh, globally. We do a lot of work in neglected tropical diseases. Uh, in Liberia, uh, we also work a lot on access to justice and focus on human rights and the opportunities that Lancet presents for expanding services to young people. So let me quickly talk about um, what I see as the opportunities presented for the work in Liberia. Uh, first, the Lancet has a huge focus on persons with lived experience. So if you haven't read uh, the commission report, please do. Uh, they also talked about emphasizing financing and investments in mental health. And from our perspective, she's told me it's already one minute. Uh, one minute left, right? <laughs> from our perspective, uh, really focusing on development banks, focusing, we currently in Liberia have a uh, grant from the World Bank to try and leverage services in two of the most populous, and it happens to be also hardly Ebola hit uh, communities. The commission focuses also on education and uh, a call to better engage schools, uh, public schools in particular, and non-formal education for young people. And our work in schools, we've established seven school-based clinics in Montserrat and Margibi County in Liberia. We trained 180 teachers using the WHO curriculum on school health. And we've be begun to train teachers, uh, 80 teachers, on brain science using University of Minnesota Brain University. So really trying to look at mental health in a very different way. And I think that emphasis comes from uh, the commission report. And when we think about reframing, as Dr. Saxena already said, mental health is integral to development and development funding and a chance to hold governments, our governments, as well as donors accountable for integrating mental health into all aspects of development. In terms of fostering human rights, uh, I think through mechanisms such as anti-stigma programming, but WHO has a wonderful toolkit that's called the Quality Rights Toolkit, and we're using it in Liberia to demand parity and accountability. Uh, in Liberia, we've completed Quality Rights Toolkits on a number of facilities, and we plan to annually report the results out. So what are the challenges that uh, we envision? One is mental health parity. Lead must come from core funders, from governments, with requirements, not recommendations, for how we reach our goals. I think for us in the uh, low and middle income countries, we feel like we have a lot of the burden, and many times the donors don't have the accountability. Finally, stigma has dire consequences, and that needs to be communicated and communicated widely. The proliferation in our settings for cures for mental illness vary from things that are called prayer camps to things that are called sick bushes that reflect our inability to improve standard of care. So when people are desperate, they try all sorts of things. So we're working with traditional healers and religious and spiritual leaders, but the work that we're doing while successful requires scaling. And I'm just talking about a tiny country in West Africa. If you think about the entire map of Africa, Asia, South America, and even the United States where this is going on. Finally, I've talked about financing, but I think development uh, funding cannot continue without an impact on mental health. Mental health has to be integral to all of the funding that we do. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank, thank you, Janice. Uh, I'm gonna keep going. Uh, next up is Dr. Simon Jaguna. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, has been introduced um, Dr. Simon Chukuna, the Director of Mental Health in Kenya. And one of my, my key responsibility as the top lead in mental health in the country is try and position mental health as a priority public health and development agenda. Uh, before the SDG, Kenya came up with a vision 2030. And one of the, uh, the aim of the vision was to be globally competitive nation with high quality of life. Uh, Kenya, 60% uh, of its population is aged below the age of 25 years of age. And so it looked at the young people as the key to the development agenda of the country. And as has been mentioned, the various uh, grad challenges in mental health, treatment gap, the burden, the disability and all that. I think we, we are going through the same challenges. And as a country, we, one of the ways to address some of these issues 
has been to develop the roadmap. And so in the year 2015, we developed the Kenya Mental Health Policy, which will guide uh, uh, the issues on mental health for the next 15 years through five-year strategic plan. And there are four key areas we are focusing on. One of these areas is on the area of leadership and governance for mental health. And the whole essence about this is trying to bring the feasibility of mental health as a public health and development agenda. And this leadership and governance for mental health is building up uh, systems and structure from the family level to county level up to the national level. One of the essence of these is to help in the planning for mental health. Because we want mental health not only to be for the specialist, but mental health for all. The same is to help in mainstreaming mental health across the sectors. As you have seen, the various uh, major determinants of mental health, both social determinants and biological determinants, and then the impact of mental health affects across various aspects of life. The other key area is on issues of access to care. And what we have thought with this big treatment gap is to address the issue of treatment gap by integrating mental health services and with a lot of focus to community mental health services. The third area is on prevention and promotion of mental health. Uh, our key focus is try and see whether there is factors and across sectors, how do we mitigate these, these factors? And again, we try to build the resilience of the population across the lifespan. And the fourth of the pillars in which we want to address the issues of mental health is strengthening mental health systems and especially on the areas of information system and research. Apart from the policy, the government has taken as a flagship project the issues of universal health coverage. And mental health is one of the component of the universal health coverage. Our aim is to make sure that health is available for all without having people go through financial burden. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simon. Okay, I'm gonna go next to uh, Ms. Chitra Hanstead. Thank you, I just wanna make um, four quick observations from um, my work with refugees about refugee mental health. Earlier this year, I was in a refugee camp in Lesbos, Greece, and in the middle of that camp was a makeshift medical center. It was just one of those UNHCR boxes with three rooms and was completely run by volunteer doctors. And in the course of the short time I was visiting, there were two incidents where people came in, rushed past all the people that were waiting in line, um, presenting, asking for medical care. Later, I found out that what they were there for were panic attacks, severe panic attacks. So it really was a mental health issue. In two of the largest reviews that have been done by the WHO, um, the prevalence of PTSD and depression, they approximate anywhere from 15 to 30% prevalence rates among refugees, compared to 1.1% among non-refugee populations. And estimates say that less than 1% of refugees in protracted displacement situations will have access to mental health care. The second um, point I'd like to make is that refugees are incredibly resilient. Though these estimates of prevalence are staggering, we can't underestimate the ability of refugees to access their own brand of healing. We also have to remember that though they've suffered incredible hardship, and oftentimes trauma, torture, sexual violence, gender-based violence, we must remember that 70 to 80% of them don't um, display signs of mental distress. We can learn from their strategies for this kind of resilience, and we must always remember what I've learned from my work is that any kind of intervention has to be community-based. Though refugees are resili resilient, we can't accept them, expect them to rebound repeatedly. The re-traumatization of refugees upon resettlement to a host country in terms of racism, bullying, and targeting only add to their difficulty in integration. 
The last two years here in the United States, we've seen an uptick in hate crimes. Hate crimes reported to the police in America's 10 largest cities rose 12.5% in 2017, according to an analysis by the FBI. In my office, I see it all the time. Um, we have to make sure that their resettlement experience is less traumatic than their migratory or displacement experience. Welcoming host country is more conducive to stable mental health. Refugees also, number three, often lack knowledge about mental health care in the United States. Mental health care can be a novel idea for some because of the cultures they come from where, where providers were not prevalent or sometimes non-existent. And finally, refugees face barriers to mental health in the United States. Um, in addition to, to the barriers of accessibility, culture, language, they also face social stigma within their own communities when they access mental health care. In that same refugee camp that I was at this summer, in the middle of that camp, there was a small square area that had double barbed wire around it. As I came over a peak, I saw people just banging on that fence inside where the UNHCR and EU officials. And the refugees I spoke to called this their yes, no appointment. Will they be able to, to be resettled or were they left there? And because of the xenophobic policies that many um, developed nations are adhering to right now, they can't go back and they can't go forward. And also in that same camp, there were 1,500 children. No toy, no book, no access to education. Simply being there, a um, couple of the kids I met had taken a couple of t-shirts, rolled them into balls, and found a basket without a bottom playing refugee basketball. Many of these children will be um, abused, face trauma. So what do we do with this? with these folks that are in these protracted situations. The whole time I was in the camp, I, get, I was reminded of a poem by Langston Hughes. Whatever happens to a dream deferred, does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? With the University of Washington, all the resources in this room, we have to make sure that everybody, especially the most vulnerable, have access to mental health care. Thank you. Wow. So just a very quick comment for the students who are here. Uh, Chitra's work, a lot of it is right here in Seattle. And if you want to learn about Global mental health, you don't have to go abroad. Uh, we have a lot of global mental health right here in Seattle, right? I'm gonna turn now to uh, Brad, uh, Dr. Brad Wagner, one of our faculty here. Thanks, Jurgen. Um, first, it's an honor and I'm humbled to be here with such amazing leaders in the field. So thank you for inviting me to speak. So during my short time, uh, very short time, I wanna try to make two points that we need to focus on prevention, not just treatment, which, we've been, which has been alluded to in the new commission. We need to focus on the macro level societal determinants of mental illness and the promotion of what I'm gonna call societal immunizations, for lack of a better word, towards mental illness. Also in terms of treatment, we need to go beyond testing individual clinical interventions using traditional biomedicine trials. We need to develop new methods to allow the analysis at the level of the system with many simultaneous clinical interventions, patient and contextual factors interacting at once. One of the most concerning things I read in the commission was that the coverage of clinical interventions has increased dramatically over the last 15 years, and yet the prevalence hasn't decreased. It stayed the same for anxiety and depression. So unlike HIV, where, where, where the primary goal now is treatment as prevention, we don't have that luxury in mental health. We can't think in the same way. Suicide rates have increased 30% 30, 30 in the past 15 years in the United States. As we said, every country is a developing country when it comes to mental health. And those increases were across all racial and ethnic groups. We now have two times as many people dying from drug overdoses as car accidents, as Jurgen mentioned earlier. 
We succeeded in decreasing car accident deaths, not just through the treatment of trauma. We succeeded through research leading to macro level societal changes, legislation on seatbelts and airbags, seatbelt laws to get people to use the seatbelts, extensive research into road environments and speed limits and infrastructure to prevent accidents from ever happening. One in five suicides is associated with unemployment. Individuals with severe debt problems are six times more likely to have mental illness. And 70 to 90% of people with severe mental illness in Canada are unemployed. We need more than just a commission. We need a coalition focused on advocacy, high quality science and public policy and social determinants, and these societal level structural factors to prevent mental distress from progressing into illness. This will likely challenge the politics of austerity and neoliberalism uh, that prioritize companies and stock prices over mental wellness. If primary success is market success, it's no surprise we'll have little success preventing mental ill health. This work, I think, is especially urgent given the rapid and continued westernization of cultures globally. Similar to the loss of biodiversity, which threatens the development of new pharmaceuticals for, say, cancer treatments or uh, new antibiotics, we should consider the loss of cultural diversity as a threat to understanding how diverse cultures have managed to immunize or build their own resilience towards mental ill health. In terms of treatment, the advent of implementation science was supposed to help scale up access in real world settings. It's my view that in the last 10 years of implementation science tends to continue the historical focus on traditional biomed biomedicine clinical research approaches. 80% of implementation science studies in, in leading journals are clinically based randomized trials. The vast majority test a single individual clinically based intervention or some small modification to the packaging or the strategy of implementing the intervention, which are now called implementation strategies. Uh, as a quick aside, I was talking to a colleague, Ricardo Araya, who said he's been involved in 40 mental health trials in his career since 2003. And I asked him, I was poking him a little bit, I said, how many of those have been scaled up? And he said two. The first one he ever ran in Chile and the most recent one he ran, the Friendship Bench, which was mentioned earlier. So that's 38 trials that weren't scaled up, leading to um, effective uh, treatment in, in the real world. So quickly at the end here, I just want to say we need to develop a new field of complex systems, analytical complex system studies, to study the interplay of these numerous simultaneous clinical interventions, policies, these economic and cultural factors, and how they affect one's mental wellness through the life course, which uh, Dr. Saxena just described, from life as a fetus to life as an octogenarian. Um, by the nature of the economic system, this is gonna challenge uh, the status quo and powerful corporate interests. So that's where I would invite everyone in this room uh, to be involved in developing a coalition for advocacy on this, on this, on this point. And to develop the science, we're gonna need everyone across all, all areas of science, all disciplines, um, to develop effective interventions and uh, prevention approaches. So um, we're gonna need a united coalition that can effectively challenge the status quo. Thank you. Yeah. Brett, can you pass the mic down to Shekhar? Shekhar, you, you've had enough time? All right, I never have enough time from you. But um, so uh, you have heard from some really, really smart people who've spent huge chunks of their lives thinking about this, working in this, being the boots on the ground. And now what I'd like to do is invite all of you to, we have two mics here. Uh, if you could, uh, these are your, these guys are yours. They're uh, spent the last day and a half serving as our external advisory board members for our new effort in global mental health. And now they're yours. Uh, and they're really smart. So please uh, get up, uh, you know, uh, uh, share a question, a comment. You can address them to everybody on these panels. These guys are not shy. Uh, uh, come up and uh, engage with this great group here. Hi there. I'm uh, Sarah Valkamp, and I am curious what, from Chitra. I'm wondering if you have seen or implemented or worked on at all programs that have worked or what you have learned from communities either on Las Vos or elsewhere, that are making um, refugees more resilient? Yeah. Um, is it on? Um, yeah, so this friendship bench idea is something that, that was shared and um, something that I saw when I was working with women who were trafficked. They had, I kind of 
coin it embedded counseling, where they would have a group of women who had come out of trafficking and would work on quilts together made out of old Saudis, but embedded in that was a counselor. And she was just a facilitator and she would say, Rupa, did you hear what so-and-so said? Have you had a similar experience? They never knew um, that that person was in their mix. They just assumed she was somebody else. But she was just a facilitator. So um, what I said about interventions being embedded in community, almost every culture that we work with, we have over 21 different nationalities that, for example, the farm with us at our community farm. Um, are very much embedded in community is important, food is important. So how do we get people together? Um, I'm trying to get University of Washington to come up with some really great ideas for us to, to do here. Yeah, that was my quick follow-up. And that, what can we do within our own communities that will help you know, our kids, our friends become more resilient? What can we learn from that? Anybody else, Anybody else want to take Which a crack at that? Okay, one of the things that, so my, I'll, I'll tell you something that we do personally. We've worked, um, we've lived and worked in the Rainier Valley and um, with the African American community in particular, and um, we've attended an African American church. And we, for the last 27 years, we, every single Monday night, we do an open house. And it's just whoever wants to come. And we started it because we were seeing so many kids. Um, needing homework help. So we started with doing homework help and then we would just eat together. And that's become kind of um, a place for people to come and talk and share ideas. And, you know, through that, it's been going on for 27 years. And now we have those kids, their families, their, you know, their children coming and they invite whoever they want. So it's, that, you know, I think just showing up is really important and being consistent is really important. I see that with the refugee communities we work with. They're just always, you know, like we have to find vehicles where we can connect them and have consistency. Okay. Um, Thank you. Abhi Pratap. I'm a data science uh, person working locally in Seattle. Uh, I'm just curious. I'm going to dovetail on what was said about scalability. So when I read through mental health interventions and guides that are being developed in small pilots, uh, it's really hard to find what was done and how the data was produced and where the data is so we can sort of cross compare and look at the efficacy. So I'm wondering what the panel has to say about a lack of reproducibility or if I can even say reusability of some of the studies that have already been done. Is this working? Okay. I'll let you guys start and I'll say something about it at the end. Yeah, I mean, I, kind of in the being more uh, or quite involved in the, the research area, this is an area of passion of mine. And I think um, there's been some work around journals forcing uh, investigators to upload their data uh, with their publications, for example. And I'm continuously frustrated at the number of amazing interventions that are published in Lancet, in JAMA, in Plus Medicine, other leading journals, and then you you are working with country colleagues, maybe at the ministry level or at the NGO level or at the facility level, and they're saying, "Wow, I really want to do this. Looks this looks amazing. We don't have anything like this," and yet, and then there's no manual uh, attached to the publication. There's no data. There's no SOP on how do you actually do it. Um, so, so what do you do? You email the lead author or one of the authors listed on the paper, and then they don't respond. And so my, what I would say, I guess, for anyone here who's in the academic community or even in the, the community outside of academia developing materials is we need, we need to be open source and we need to share our manuals and our actual nitty gritty details of how you do these things so that people can, can do it. I don't, I don't understand why something that's funded, primary, a lot of things that are funded by the U.S. government, for example, are not open access to everyone who wants to use them in terms of the manuals and the details. So uh, I appreciate your, your question. I can just say on the project we're working on with the World Bank, that data is available and the manuals are available. They've been adapted for the Liberia setting and, they, and they're all available and, and you can have access to them. So, and I think that's more and more the way that um, a lot of the funders are, are moving actually and that's, that's definitely the case for the World Bank. So I'll add a comment. Uh, so 
we are very good as a community to look at all the things that are wrong in our world. And we, we tend to be great at talking about all the deficits and the burdens and all this, but I'm actually a glasses half full kind of person. So I'm going to try to put a little bit more of a positive spin on this. Uh, you know, there are lots of problems with the evidence we have. Uh, there are problems with the data we have. Tio and, and us talked yesterday and Chris mentioned that we don't have perfect data yet, but actually uh, there are areas in, in mental health intervention where we have a tremendous amount of evidence, uh, you know, where there is tremendous agreement on what works and what doesn't work, you know, uh, uh, but we don't always have the data for somebody like you to reproduce. Actually, one of the things that the federal government has done uh, recently is if you now take money from the federal government uh, for a research study that's federally funded, uh, you actually have now an obligation to make that data publicly available. That's a huge change from when I started working in the field and doing randomized control trials. So I just want to acknowledge that. The other thing I will say is you said, you know, or maybe you said you don't know how they got the result. Uh, that's actually a huge thing. So we learned this in spades. So one of the things we just to toot our own horn here as a university a little bit, we are very good at, we have two decades of experience here uh, developing a, a, an intervention approach called collaborative care. That is where you work with a primary care provider and you support them uh, as a mental health provider to do really good care for depression, anxiety, other common mental health problems. And there are 80 randomized control trials that tell us that this works better than usual care. And out of those 80 trials, we have a pretty solid set of principles that if you don't screw them up, you gotta, you gotta pretty get a pretty good result, but you're right. When uh, somebody reads a JAMA paper or a Lancet paper with a nice results table, they don't know how to do it. So uh, you actually have to invest a fair amount of time in, in translating all of that research data into tools that are super usable. So in our case, we've had to spend 10 years putting on a website for free all the tools that people come up with to say, once I've got the result in a research trial, what is the job description like? What is the manual like? How do I hire somebody like that? Uh, so there's lots of nuts and bolts stuff that I think we can commit to as a field producing for people to make it more useful. Sorry. So I'll go on to the next question. Um, I actually am standing up as a result of that question. Um, I have um, recovered fully from schizoaffective disorder. And um, the worst doctor I ever had was like, oh, you have this. This is your issue. Like it was like a holistic journey to recovery. And that's what I love about what I heard from your presentation because it, it gets all of the little pieces that can set somebody off balance and it takes this individualized approach um, while looking at the holistic aspects of what can make people suffer in society. So I just want to say thank you for recognizing the holistic nature of mental suffering. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody want to comment on that? Thank you very much. Very important. Hi. Um, yeah. Well, that actually. Can you can you introduce yourself? Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm Andrew Bryant. I'm a clinical social worker. I'm going to do a quick plug for social work here because um, for decades, social work in research and practice has been working in the trenches with a eco bio psych psychosocial approach uh, out of necessity. Well, you know, people in other fields were working, were asking you about your mother. Um, and my dad's a uh, psychiatrist, so I can kind of make fun of him there. But, you know, the, the um, social justice aspect, uh, strength-based approach uh, is really rich in the social, social work field. And haven't heard it mentioned too much here, so I just want to encourage that uh, collaboration. Okay, my question is... Um, thinking about the weather outside in a recent report, the IPCC report on climate change came out last week. Do you have any thoughts on how we're gonna address mental health as it relates to uh, climate breakdown, uh, refugee, environmental refugees, um, stress over loss of ecosystems? I'm, ex I'm anticipating a lot of, um, a lot of uh, problems arising in the next 50 years as a re result of that, especially, well, not especially, but in particular mental health, and I don't hear that much discussed. So any thoughts? I'd appreciate it. So I think one of the strongest things we can do for that is to make sure that people who are most um, affected by climate change, which is usually um, minority populations, become the champions in their communities and lead the charge. 
um, the garden slash farm that I talked about is completely green infrastructure. We were just nominated by the Gates Foundation as green, um, we got honorable mention. Um, but we're training refugee youth to lead, to design the rain gardens and to teach the whole Kent School District is learning their science curriculum on, on the garden. But, it's, but I think to give people, um, to empower people to be their own voice in that is really key because most kids are thinking about it, they're learning about it and there's stress associated with it. But to make sure that they become the voice and the champions for their communities, I think that's really important. Yeah, maybe I can add a point to your question, a very good question. It's mental health in a changing world. There's uh, climatic changes in, to do with the environmental changes, uh, changes in the ICT, changes in population movement, there are wars and population movement. And as has been the focus for the World Mental Health Day this year, is on the issues of the changing world, and especially to the young people because it's one of the major demographic when you think about mental health. And as has been mentioned, our mind, our future, our humanity. Uh, as mental health professionals, we need to be very prepared uh, to, to address these issues and try to see, uh, let's not be caught unaware. We must be very prepared. Preparedness is, is a key thing. And one of the, the, the issues in terms of preparedness is issues of risk reduction. We need to foresee some of these risks and come up with strategies to see that uh, they don't affect our mental health, as I've said, our mind, our future, our humanity. So if we think about the humanity in a changing world, we think about our future in a changing world, we must be prepared. And I think the global mental health is now bringing this kind of focus, trying to think about uh, doing research, study about uh, mental health interventions, evidence-based uh, uh, strategies, to address the global mental health challenges and the changing world, and especially to the young people, is where we need to have the preparedness. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, I would just say that, remember the, the beginning of the commission was twinning with SDGs. And so if you look at SDG 11, which talks about mm -hmm. cities as livable places, and SDG 13 that talks about climate change and its impact, I think we really need to make that twinning real and it, does, it, it goes beyond a piece of paper. It goes to what are the interventions that are gonna make that twinning real, I think. Okay, oh, well, let me just quickly say something too. I mean, I think, I think that twinning and, and creating these links is what's gonna give us power. Because I think, you know, as we've talked about, why hasn't mental health risen to the top of the agenda? Well, it's because we haven't, I don't think, effectively made the number of links we need to, to then create a coalition that we can work together rather than working in a silo. We need to avoid creating just a mental health silo and we work on mental health. We need to create all of these links, which I think the commission really highlighted. So appreciate your question. Okay, we're gonna do one more question and then we're gonna uh, wrap up this session. Okay. My name is Janice Tefty and I'm a PCORI ambassador, a patient partner engaged in health research with Kaiser Was Group Health. And I recently attended the Global Alliance um, conference at Anschutz Medical Center about a week and a half ago. And um, Dr. Vikram Patel showed the same set of um, slides. So I had a little bit of heads up about this and was aware when it rolled out. But um, I wanted to say that one of the most impressive workshops I went to there was on stigma. And I haven't seen that yet. And is Dr. Daniel Goldberg, I'll just give you his name, but I'm sure there's quite a few other doctors. He's at I think, the University of Colorado. But that workshop had the most impact on individuals that went to it. We all were talking about it. He just sent me his slides today. I had to keep asking him for them. But I feel that the stigma is something, you know, is something we really have to look at. And he really drummed down about how it impacts. That was an orthopsychiatry conference too. So, right. I don't know if anybody has any comments on that. You guys want to talk about stigma? We spoke a lot about stigma yesterday, so I'm sure you guys want to talk about stigma. Yeah, I know this is a difficult uh, subject about stigma. Uh, from what I highlighted as one of the objectives in, in our country in terms of uh, leadership and governance, it's key really trying to address the issues not only about resources, but also about issues like stigma. And one of the key aspects is 
trying to build uh, mental health literacy. That, that's why you want to build leadership from the, the grassroots level, from addressing the social cultural issues at the grassroots levels with the religious leaders, the community leaders, and all the way up to the policy makers. So the whole essence about leadership is having the leadership within the population and trying to bring up the literacy levels on issues of mental health. Our aim is to having a critical mass of this knowledge and change of attitude among the people and try to see whether we can shift the issues on how people view about mental health. Another key element about leadership and governance is about empowerment persons with mental illness. And as it has been mentioned, this is men mental health is that continuum about mental health, good posit positive mental health, mental distress, all the way, and trying to build that mental health is not for a specific group of people. It's mental health is for all of us. And so trying to build that, bringing that knowledge through leadership, and also addressing issues of human rights. That's why I'm talking about leadership and governance, that there are specific registrations, there are specific people within the community making sure that there is no any form of discriminations, issues of violation of human rights are looked at. Thank you. I can say a few things about what we've been doing in terms of stigma. So. Uh, how many people know about crisis intervention training for police officers? So in Liberia, we started doing CIT, crisis intervention training, where law enforcement is trained on how to interact and in, intervene in the case of an emergency in a safe way. Many, before we started training law enforcement officers, uh, they felt that people with mental illness were necessarily dangerous and they came into a situation in a very combative and often hostile and dangerous physically dangerous way. Uh, police officers now know how to access a scene, how to de-escalate a situation, and that has resulted not only in the impact on persons with mental illness and intervening, but in their regular work where use of force is used less often than it was used before. So certainly working with police officers and those that are involved in situations that could, de uh, could escalate and become uh, violent you can certainly use that strategy, and we've been using that. Uh, we've also been uh, using, working with people with lived experience so that they are going into classrooms, they're training our providers in how to work with persons with mental illness, what are some of the things that persons with mental illness uh, experience when they first encounter a provider, and how it makes them feel so they are aware of what it feels to be on the other side. And I think that that's really, really important. I think the, the human rights perspective, until we start taking it from a human rights perspective, we're not really gonna deal with stigma until organizations such as ours and others that are providing services are held accountable for treating persons with mental illness with dignity and respecting their human rights, we're not gonna overcome that. So I think that there are many strategies we just have to be committed to doing those strategies and recognize that it is part of our overall intervention. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak to stigma? Um, I, I guess I just want to reiterate what um, Simon was saying around. I, I personally think the, the staging approach or the dimensional approach is, is helpful because calling, identifying one group as being somehow so different from all other humans is not helpful, especially for stigma. That, that, that's, that's the source of stigma. So we need to think about all of ourselves as suffering from you know, mental distress at different points in our lives. And some people don't get the support they need, whether that's social or psychological or environmental or whatever, right? And so then that might progress to a mental health problem that needs more specialty care. But I think if we, we need to start thinking about this in more broad strokes and that it affects all of us and I think that really is one of the key elements here. I like to think that we should consider um, teaching uh, basic CBT and health class to all young people. We need to teach people how to self-care techniques and that should be part of basic education because if you don't have positive mental health how can you benefit from education? So I think there's, there's unique ways in which I think this commission starts pushing uh, the idea forward of how we can um, improve this in multiple ways. Okay, let me make a few comments to wrap up this, this session. So first of all, to pick up on Brad's comment and other people's comments, uh, you know, mental illness is really humbling and it does not discriminate. It comes at all of us. You know, I'm a psychiatrist. I have my share of, you know, encounters, you know, in my own life, in my family's life with mental health and substance use problems. Doesn't matter how smart I am. Doesn't 
protect me. Uh, I think that's important. We have to be comfortable saying that it's the truth. Uh, and once you make it, uh, you know, it makes it too easy if you can say these are the people who are crazy and the rest of us are well. That's, I think, really, really important. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say about stigma is, uh, you know, a big part of stigma, stigma is very complex. And we have people here like uh, Deepa Rao who spend their career studying stigma. So I don't want to uh, sort of make it sound like it's simple, but in my experience, one of the big parts of stigma is fear. It's a frightening thing to think that, you know, somehow your mind could take, you know, a leave of absence and you're not in control of yourself and you might be doing things that, you know, are really frightening and other people are frightened. And if you walk with a two-year-old kid, you know, uh, and you encounter somebody who is in the throes of psychosis, that little kid, you know, doesn't have biased views about that person, but that little kid realizes, whoa, there's something going on, you know. So it's, it can be really scary uh, to be struggling with a mental illness. I think we have to uh, sort of, uh, you know, accept that. Uh, but what do you do about that? So I think the most important thing, uh, one of the most important things we can do about stigma is to say it doesn't have to be this way. There are ways to treat this. There are ways to solve this problem. I think, you know, you working with the cops, to say when you encounter somebody who is kind of acting crazy, scary, there is ways in which you can work with them. You know, you don't have to restrain them or shoot them. There are other things you can do. That's huge, right? Uh, so I'll just give a very brief example because we have another minute or two. But I did my medical training during the time where we had AIDS, but we didn't have treatments for AIDS yet. I was a medical intern uh, in a hospital in Los Angeles where every night one or two of my patients died and I got really good at pronouncing people dead and it was a really frightening time. People were dying, they had horrible diseases that we didn't understand terribly well. Uh, they were scared, I was scared, the nurses were scared, we were all scared. And there was a tremendous amount of stigma that it was attached to AIDS. Uh, and you know, AIDS is still a somewhat stigmatized problem, but think about the change that happened when we start getting treatments that really work. Uh, and, and now you have somebody walking uh, or working down the hall from you, uh, you know, who lives with HIV. Uh, and it's a very, very different thing because it's now a chronic illness. Uh, so I think that uh, we have, and I'm going back to my earlier comment, uh, we are too good, I think, in mental health to see all the things that are wrong with the world. We have to be able to say there are lots of things we can do to help you with this. People can recover. You can get well. Uh, we need to be saying that because if we don't say that, uh, we're not going to help with all the stigma. Uh, the other thing that's going to happen is if we don't, and I, I see a whole bunch of people in this room who know, who've seen great examples of mental health treatment working both here in the U.S. and also on the ground. And I hope all of you can stand up and tell your stories because if we don't do that, the other thing that's not going to happen is I'm going to something Alicia said to me yesterday. So you saw a shaker slide, no money going to mental health. Well, if there's nothing that can be done about it and it's terribly stigmatized, why would anybody want to give money to it, right? We need to be able to say, if you give us money, there's lots of great things we can do. So let's not be too negative here. Let's try to sort of say, and I think that is in the commission, there's a lot that we can do that we must do. And I want everybody in this room to say, if you've had a good experience, go out, talk about it. I think that's really, really important. So... Uh, we're right on time. Uh, I want to thank our great panelists. I want to thank all of you for a great first uh, panel here. Uh, let's take a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back.